Have you ever suffered with problematic skin? Have you gone into your bathroom and looked at the hundreds of products and thought, I need to figure out which ones are working for me and which ones are not? Have you ever eaten food and known that you break out because of certain items but not been able to figure out which ones? Or have you seen signs of aging and found that nothing is working? then this series is for you. And it is a series where I am going to break down exactly how you are making or breaking your skin's health from the inside and the food that you consume to the outside and the products that you apply to it. So just like you never wanna miss a Monday workout, you are not gonna wanna miss Skincare Sundays. Okay, for our first episode, I wanna talk about cleansers because they are an often overlooked, I think, facet of skincare. People think, you know, you apply your cleanser and you just wash it away with water, um, and it's easier to focus on other things like your nutrition and topical treatments, but I think everything starts with how well you cleanse your skin and the product that you're using to cleanse it with. Not only is cleansing responsible for removing the dirt, debris, pollution, bacteria, all the stuff that's sitting on your skin's surface just waiting to clog your pores or cause damage, but it also preps your skin to be able to properly absorb the oftentimes expensive topical treatments that you're going to follow it with. So let's talk about our skin a little bit. In the 1920s, the acidity of our skin was identified in the hydrolipid layer. Now this layer is something that sits on top of the outermost surface of your skin called the stratum corneum. And it's a protective and slightly acidic layer which acts as a barrier between your skin and the rest of the world. If there was something that disrupted this barrier, your skin would be more inclined towards damage, to invasion from bacteria, to free radical damage, water would be more easily able to escape, and your skin would start throwing up these red flags that something was wrong with it. I don't know what this was. That, those are my red flags. It would start showing you that it's irritated. It would start overproducing oil to protect itself. It would even start increasing its enzymatic activity, and you would notice that through tons and tons of dead skin all over your face. So, so there's a whole host of signs that there's something wrong with this protective layer. The pH of this layer always wants to sit at a comfortable 4.5 to 6.5. And on the pH scale, this is slightly acidic. This is a perfect environment. Not only does it kill the bad bacteria, which can cause infections, acne, what have you, but it also is an environment where the good bacteria that actually protects your skin can thrive. It also is the perfect level for maintaining the skin's enzymatic activity, so it's not overproducing dead skin, but it can still regenerate itself and leave you looking radiant, and it keeps water trapped in your skin so that you're not losing hydration. Now, let's talk about the pH level a little bit. pH stands for potential of hydrogen, and it is a scale by which we can rank things as being acidic or alkaline or basic. It ranges from zero to 14, dead in the middle is seven, and that is water. It's neither acidic nor basic. Anything below seven is acidic, and so that's things like vinegar or tomatoes, citrus, what have you. And above seven is basic or alkaline, so that's things like drain cleaner and bleach and ammonia. An important thing to note actually is that only aqueous substances have pH. So only if it is water soluble will a substance have a pH level. Using a cleanser that keeps your skin at a happy pH level is so important and it will completely ward off a host of problems. So how do you figure out right now whether your skin based on the products that you're using is too acidic or too alkaline or happy? So if your skin is oily, if it gets greasy really easily, especially based on the moisturizer that you use, if it is constantly irritated or it is sensitive to products, chances are your skin is too acidic. And again, your skin wants to be slightly acidic, but of course you can go too far and that's when you will start to see these signs. Now, on the other hand, if your skin is really tight and dry and you wanna moisturize multiple times a day, if your skin is crepey and never really looks radiant, if it never looks plump and kinda of looks sunken and sallow and you can see fine lines, if you notice that after a period of this, your skin is all of a sudden overproducing oil um, or that you're prone to breakouts, chances are 
you are too alkaline. Now, to understand better what we're going to talk about next, we do have to mention the Bronsted-Lowry acid-base theory. And this is a theory which explains that when water mixes with an acid, the acid wants to donate a hydrogen ion to the water. And when water mixes with an alkaline, the alkaline substance wants to take a hydrogen ion from the water. So in both situations, it's a reaction where water is either accepting or donating a hydrogen ion. You don't have to know where the hydrogen ion is coming from, but just know this much. So now let's explain this a little bit further. So when acid mixes with the water in our skin, it donates a hydrogen ion to our water, and this reaction causes a process called denaturing of the protein in our skin. Protein in our skin is responsible for giving our skin structure and protection, and if it is destroyed, then our skin loses its protection. What happens is the protein cells die, but they don't disintegrate. So you will see sometimes with overuse of an acid product that you have patches of scaly skin on your surface. And that is a process called coagulative necrosis, and that patch is actually called a coagulum. Since this coagulum is sitting on your skin surface, it has the ability to slightly protect the acid from going deeper into your skin layers, thereby keeping the acid burn more superficial. Now, people commonly think that an acid burn would be worse than an alkaline burn, but that is not the case. If you've ever seen Dexter or any similar show where someone's trying to dispose of a dead body, they're using alkaline substances. So what it does is it doesn't cause coagulative necrosis and leave you with this patch of skin that's going to protect you a little bit. Instead, it causes liquefaction, a process by which cells liquefy and dissolve, leaving you with pockets of dead skin. Now, while alkaline substances denature proteins, they also dissolve fats through a process called saponification. So this causes the entire structure of your skin to break down. And of course, the alkaline substance is free to penetrate into deeper layers of your skin, leaving you with a much more severe burn. So that is why using products which keep your pH level as close to the happy 4.5 to 6.5 as possible are so important. Of course, things that you're picking up through the drugstore have been tested and the chances of you suffering with these side effects is not high, but you can have minor burns and irritations to the products and if you can prevent it, why not? So let's take a break from pH talk and discuss the types of cleansers you can use. There are water-soluble cleansers and oil-soluble cleansers. There are two important things that you need to remember. Number one, like attracts like or like dissolves like, okay? And number two is the concept of polar molecules versus non-polar molecules. Polar molecules are like batteries. They have poles. Uh, positive charge on one end and a negative charge on another end, and they are constantly trying to attract the extra charge to make both sides balanced. Then you have nonpolar molecules, which are already balanced, therefore they are nonpolar. They don't have a gradient of charge. They have the same charge all the way around, so they're stable and not looking to exchange charges with other molecules in order to find that stability. Now, water, is a polar molecule. It has a positive charge on one end and a negative charge on another end, so it's looking to exchange charges in order to balance itself out. Oil, on the other hand, is a non-polar molecule, and it doesn't have a pH because oil doesn't dissolve in water, it's not water-soluble, it's not an aqueous substance, and as we mentioned earlier, only aqueous substances have pHs. So let's apply this to your skin. Water-soluble cleansers will disrupt your skin's pH. Why? Because first of all, a pH mixing with another pH, there's always going to be some kind of exchange. And water is a polar substance. It's imbalanced. It's looking to exchange charges in order to find balance. So to do that, it's going to have to pull something from your skin in order to find it. Oil-soluble cleansers, on the other hand, will not disrupt your pH. Why? Because oil doesn't have a pH to disrupt your pH with because it's not water soluble. When using an oil cleanser, the only pH that will disrupt your skin is the one that you wash away the oil with. The way that oil works to cleanse your skin is the concept of like dissolves like or like attracts like. 
oil doesn't mix with water, but it does mix with other oils. So your natural oils hold on to dirt and debris and pollution like magnets. And the cleansing oil that you apply will help mix in with the oil that's already on your skin and you can wash it away easily. Water soluble cleansers wouldn't be able to do this because water doesn't mix with the oil. So the oil will remain on your skin and not get cleansed away. Makeup contains oil too. So using an oil cleanser will also help remove makeup. So my recommendation is to take a good look at the products that you're using, look up their pH levels, and analyze how they're making your skin feel. If they're leaving your skin feeling red and irritated and oily despite having just been cleansed, uh, chances are that the product is too acidic. If, on the other hand, you find that your skin feels tight and taut right after cleansing. Um, the topical ingredients that you apply afterwards are kind of burning your skin and all of a sudden you're overproducing oil soon afterwards and your pores get easily clogged, then chances are the products that you're using are too alkaline. Okay, so now that we understand the science behind it, let's talk about what I personally do to cleanse my skin. Number one, I always start off with the makeup wipe. Um, you can basically use any wipe. I like to use the Neutrogena ones um, or the Kirkland brand ones from Costco because you can buy them in bulk. The reason why I do this is because when I go in with a cleansing product, I don't want to just be moving around the makeup on, on my face. I want to actually do some cleansing. So by using a wipe, I'm able to just take away that layer that's sitting on top of my skin so that the cleanser is actually getting closer to my skin um, rather than only washing away the surface products. You know what I mean? That's why I say it doesn't really matter what makeup wipe you're using because you're going to go in and cleanse afterwards anyways. The point is just to remove a good majority of what's sitting on top of your skin by the end of the day. Then I will go in with an oil cleanser. The reason why I do this is again because like attracts like and not only does makeup contain oil but my natural oils have accumulated on the surface of my skin and I want to use an oil cleanser to dissolve those. Oil is also a gentle way to remove the debris that sits on top of your skin and it will be the second step in my three-step cleansing process. So my favorite oil cleanser on the market is the Tatcha Camellia Cleansing Oil. The reason why I love Camellia Oil and I do just use the natural store-bought pure Camellia Oil to cleanse as well is because it is suitable for sensitive skin and if it's suitable for sensitive skin then basically any skin can use it. Camellia oil is rich in oleic acid, omegas 3, 6, and 9, and vitamins A, B, D, and E. The Tatcha cleanser in particular mixes the camellia oil with Uji green tea, which is a powerful antioxidant and prevents premature aging. It also mixes it with mozuku algae, which helps the skin retain water, and akita rice, which is rich in essential protein. You could also, of course, use, like I said, camellia oil, the single ingredient on its own, and you can find it at any health food store or online, like at Amazon, and I will include a few uh, links down below. But if you have other specific skin concerns or if you don't wanna use camellia oil, then I have other suggestions for you. For oily skin, I recommend grapeseed oil or pumpkin seed oil. For acne prone skin, rosehip, hemp seed, jojoba, castor oil, any of those will work. For dry skin, extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, and almond oil. And universally flattering is argan oil. The numbers I've included adjacent to the oil names are their rankings on the comedogenic scale. This is a system of ranking how likely it is that an ingredient will clog pores on a scale of zero to five. Zero being it won't clog pores at all, one being there's a very low likelihood, two being a low likelihood, three being a moderate likelihood, four being a fairly high likelihood, and five being it'll clog pores. An oil that I find people use all the time is coconut oil, and coconut oil is a four on the comedogenic scale. So if you're prone to acne, it's basically the worst thing that you can be using. Now let's talk about how I actually use the oil. So I've just removed my makeup, or if, I'm, if I haven't worn makeup, then I won't use a makeup wipe. I'll go in with the oil on a dry face. So there's no water that I've wet my face with first. This is because I want the oil to not have a barrier between it and the other oils. It's just my way of thinking. Really, the oil will find its way to the other oil on my skin. So I really massage it into my skin. I work all the way around my face and my neck, and then I do my eyes last so that you're not moving around all your eye makeup 
to the rest of your face. Then once it looks like everything is dissolved on my skin, I will take a damp washcloth and I will stick it under the tap on as hot of a setting as I can get my water to be. And I will drench the washcloth in the water. Once I notice that the washcloth is kind of steaming, I'll turn off the water, I'll wring it out and I will lay it on my face. I will stand there for as long as it takes for the washcloth to feel cool to the touch or room temperature to the touch. What this is doing is it's opening my pores, making the pore clogging oils more available to be wiped away, and it's just a nice like spa experience at home. So when I notice that the washcloth is no longer warm, I will just wipe off everything that's on my skin and wring out the cloth, rinse it a few times, then put it in the wash and proceed to my last cleansing step. So the last cleansing step is when I go in with a water-soluble cleanser. The way I see it, the makeup wipe removes the surface dirt, debris, makeup, etc. Then the oil goes in and cleans up anything else and the oils that have cum accumulated on my skin. And then the water cleanser will go in and actually clean my skin now that everything is off of it. Because a lot of the time people only cleanse once and all you're doing at that point is taking away everything that's sitting on top of your skin. You're not actually cleansing or treating your skin at its core. Now my holy grail cleanser and what I give all the credit to for curing me of terrible, terrible acne is the Drunk Elephant Juju Bar. Now I use the Juju Bar at night. In fact, this whole cleansing process is only at night, not in the morning. But the bar is made up of thermal mud to detoxify and tone the skin and bamboo powder to softly exfoliate the skin. Now the bar is fragrance-free, soap-free, and vegan. It's also formulated with a pH of 6.3, so it's neither too drying or too stripping of the skin's natural acidity. It is a perfect equilibrium. So after using this, not only do I know for sure that my skin is properly cleansed and ready to accept the topical ingredients that I will use to treat my skin, afterwards, but it's also exfoliated at the end of the day of all the, I guess, dead skin and texture that my skin has built up through the day. Now, when people think of exfoliation, they go over the top. They think that if you are not feeling abrasion on your skin, you're not exfoliating, but that is not the case. The rule of thumb is if you can sense abrasion, your skin is feeling it a thousand million times more. Um, and what you're doing is actually creating micro tears on your skin that are so hard to repair and leave your skin with all these cuts in it so that there's all these entrance points for bacteria and pollutants into the deeper layers of your skin causing long-term damage. Now that's all for a whole separate video, but my point being the bamboo in this cleanser is soft and it won't feel like your normal feeling exfoliant, but it does such a good job and it really leaves your skin with such a healthy, radiant, even toned glow once you're done. I do not have problematic skin at the moment, but I do naturally and cleansing in this way has completely transformed the health of my skin. Um, I think I there's like one spot I'm sure you can see or maybe you can see is healing. It's um, discolored. It was a acne mark that I picked and I shouldn't have. But it's the first breakout that I've gotten in almost a year, and it's because of using this cleansing method religiously. It's definitely a lot to do to double cleanse, triple cleanse, um, but you know, for the sake of your health and your long term anti aging goals, it is such a small price to pay. You can do it very, very quickly, and honestly, it's kind of like a meditative process for me at the end of every single night. It allows me to wind down and really make sure that I'm going to bed feeling crisp and clean, absorbing all the good ingredients that I put on my skin after cleansing, and I can wake up in the morning knowing that I've done something good for my skin overnight if I've done nothing else good for my skin. So I'm gonna call it here for today. I know that that was really brief, or hopefully it is really brief when I edit this, but I'm gonna try and bring you smaller chunks of information that are easy to watch time-wise and easy to absorb information-wise. If you like this video and if it brought you 
any insight into the science behind your skincare, then please give me a thumbs up and let me know that it resonated with you. Please share this video with anyone that you know who might benefit from it. If you would like to know what I do next following this step or how I cleanse in the morning, how to treat specific skin concerns or even a breakdown of popular market items and whether or not they actually live up to their claims then please let me know in the comments below and also leave me a comment on what you thought of this video and anything else you'd like to see next related or unrelated and i will see you soon bye oh folks talk about back in my day but homie, this is my day. Class started two hours ago. Oh, am I late? No, I already graduated. And you can live through anything if magic made it.